Okay. Well, good morning. It's uh, pretty early here in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Kathy and I are at Pastors Conference for the Friends Eastern Region, and we thought we would do the chat some more different. And uh, so, thank you for joining us this morning for another Easy Chair chat. I'm in the Sermon on the Mount and got through the Beatitudes, moving into a new section of the Sermon on the Mount. So let me read my text, and it is Matthew 5, 17 to 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So as I said, this begins a new section in the Sermon on the Mount. Chapter 5, verses 1 to 16 describe kingdom people, who they are, what they look like. Chapter 5, 17 to 48 describes what they do. Jesus is going to take six Old Testament laws and interpret them, saying, you've heard that it was said this, but I say to you. Living in the 21st century America, we're not very law conscious. Not so in first century Israel. The law meant everything to them. It was life itself. Even God studied the Torah, they said. So that word Torah is the Hebrew word for law, and it has several meanings. It could mean the Ten Commandments. It could mean the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, also was called the Torah. It could mean the entire Old Testament. It was called the Law and the Prophets. And fourthly, it can mean the tradition of the elders. I'm going to say more on that later. It's the latter one, the tradition of the elders, that the people focused on and that Jesus and Paul were against. The law seemed beyond the grasp of most Jews of Jesus' day. The Pharisees and the scribes called them ignorant because they were ignorant of the law. The scribes and Pharisees wore long robes and had scripture verses dangling. They did fastings and long prayers in public. They adhered closely to the tradition of the elders. One of my favorite movies is Fiddler on the Roof. The movie opens with a spry fiddler precariously perched on a roof. Like him, we try to make music of our lives, but we have no level ground to stand on. Tevia knows what gives stability. Tradition. Tradition tells you who you are and what God expects of you. So the people listening to Jesus that afternoon wanted to know what he thought of the law. He was a new teacher in Israel. They had heard that his teaching was different. He was accused of being against the law. He worked on the Sabbath by healing the sick. He didn't observe the ceremonial washings. He seemed to disregard dietary laws. He spoke with an authority greater than that of their religious leaders. So where does he stand on the law? The Old Testament. So Jesus tells him, in verse 17, he says, I haven't come to abolish or destroy the law, but to fulfill it, to full, fill it. He fills it up. He completes it to the very dotting of an I or crossing of a T. The old English words found in the King James were jot and tittle. The jot, or yod, is the smallest Hebrew letter. It looks like a little apostrophe. But the tittle, well, let me describe it as two Hebrew letters look alike. The only a tiny tail on the one differentiates the two. So the slightest stroke of the pen, as the NIV puts it, Jesus fulfills the smallest detail. That's very important. That shows that the Bible was inspired by God. 
the Bible and understanding it and interpreting it correctly is incredibly important. The Old Testament, too, because that was Jesus' Bible. I, I want to show you that by reading a passage from Matthew 22, verses 29 to 32. Jesus replied, You are in error because you don't know the Scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the living. So a lot is said in that passage about the resurrection. And the whole argument Jesus is making boils down to a verb tense. Jesus' listeners did not believe in the resurrection, the scribes, because the Pentateuch didn't clearly teach it. So the argument of Jesus here boils down to a verb tense. Is versus was. Present tense versus past tense. Jesus is saying men are still alive in heaven. So therefore there is a resurrection. Jesus had the highest regard for Scripture. Do we play loose with Scripture and Jesus warns of hell? But so many people have such little or no regard for Scripture. Even some Christians, they don't view the Bible as the Word of God, as the final authority for their life and behavior. They're determined to do what they want to do. It doesn't matter what God says. The people of old felt that way too. In Jeremiah 7, 9 through 11. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known and then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name and say we are safe, safe to do all these detestable things? Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching declares the Lord. That's a hard word and very serious what Jesus is saying here. He says the kingdom of heaven hangs in the balance that you won't enter heaven unless you have a high regard for scripture. So how do we treat God's word? Do we take it seriously? I want to show you two errors and dangers that Christians are prone to when it comes to the Bible and then discuss a third that I believe is the correct way. So I'm going to share those things in the coming weeks ahead. Again, thanks for joining us this morning. We're trying to bring you to Gatlinburg, even have our evangelical friends t-shirts on, but it's a little cold, so we have jackets over them. And hopefully background noise of the morning is, is okay. You know, I, I see a correlation um, with this. I have felt this for a long time um, from a Hillsong song. I see a generation rising up to take their place. And if so, with this generation, it would be taking a hold of the word, but some of the benefits of this gospel for what it is meant to be grasped. Like Martin Luther King, said I have a dream there is a sense that the last shall be first and the first shall be last that there is a group that God is awaiting to take hold of some of his realities in a fresh way that had have been grasped in previous generations and brought maybe what people are waiting for right now as a great awakening and I'll I'll touch on ones that I when I grasp some of the reality I see a generation rising up for this when I became a Christian the four spiritual laws were um, very used and I mean good um, for me I was you know acknowledged I was a sinner pray to receive Jesus and then told my sins were forgiven and then you know you want to have the affirmation Jesus has come inside and thankfully um, he, he did. Um, so what was the Holy Spirit witnessing to me in these early days? 
Honey Tree, a songwriter in that time, said, Clean before my Lord I stand. So if you were to tell me my slate was so clean, it would be as if I never sinned. And is there a difference if, if you are to say to yourself, oh, my sins are forgiven, or I am in a place as if I never sinned. I know some people have used the word justification, just as if I had not sinned. Well, I know when I mentioned this to Ed, he said, you better have scripture to back this up. So let's um, think about who matters, God. If he says he doesn't remember, isn't that the same reality as if I've never sinned? Well, let's see. The righteousness now that God wants to disclose about himself, this is Romans 3.26, is that he is just, and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. So you have this paradox. God is just when he punishes, and he's merciful when he pardons, because pardon doesn't mean that it's just like by the law. But the stumbling block is when you bring the two together. God is just when he pardons. So what can masterfully bring both parts together? Well, he brings us together because he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. So justice has his, its full satisfaction. We are made the righteousness of God in him. And mercy has her heart's delight, as one writer says. There's a hilarity, I think, in this. It fulfills both by God's wonderful design. He is just and the justifier. So some scriptures about how God would see this, and that's all that matters. Psalms 103, 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So the great width of the world is a sign of how God's mercy is dealing with his removal of sins so far. God's mercy is the cause, the removal of sin is the result. The two intermingling are described as the largest measures that the earth could provide. Hebrews 10, 17, their sinless sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. God, not remember. Jeremiah 31, 34, each one teach his neighbor to know the Lord. They will all know me, for I will forgive their wickedness, wickedness and remember their sins no more. Isaiah 38, 17, surely is for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. In your love, God, you kept me from the pit of destruction. You have put all my sins behind your back. Micah 7, 19, again, have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Gone, gone, gone. They are meant to be gone. There's not the sense like I could go, keep going to the sink and incessantly washing my hands because I have this sense of stain and wrong. I've been thinking about that hymn that says, How can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? younger generation or the generation how do you gain that interest in the savior's blood well someone puts it there everyone who hears and learns from the father comes to me so there is something that is put there to gain an interest in the savior's blood isaiah 53 deals with this bearing our sin being pardoned from the punishment infused with christ's righteousness and our sins, our sin nature, imputed to him, as we read before, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Okay, this came to a light on a personal experience I had at a recent grief share. And this video I wish everyone alive could watch. It was on regrets and guilt, especially when this loved one passes. And as I watched this, I was aware of my mom at, them, at that point sitting in a hospital room 500 miles away without hearing aids or her glasses. And I realized as I watched this, I'm just abiding my time. 
when the bombshell comes that she has passed, okay, I'll, I'll deal with the regrets at that time. And all of a sudden it's like, well, why wait? Why wait with the plan to deal with these regrets? And three regrets slash sins came to mind being unavailable in the present for times like this when she is in need annoyance when I so much want to connect with her in these phone calls and either confusion or hearing like we can't communicate and the last being just when I have been uncomplimentary and what I've shared about her or our situation I, but these three things came to a height and it's like well confess it I was right to they fell off my tongue and what happened with that confession well the counselor said it was it's as if you never sinned against that person and it's like I can receive this decades of this same thing I can receive that I have never sinned against her and I realized that this isn't just for me here and now this is the story of what forgiveness has been through the ages it's enough to rise off your seat and shout it from the mountaintops it's enough that a new generation would seize that this is what forgiveness is. We've been short changing forgiveness. It is that good. But there is an element. You know, someone will ask me, well, how are things going in Ohio or whatever. And so then my tongue that has done these same sins for decades is going to have to answer. Am I drawn back into the same cesspool that I've been in? Well, God that is so great doesn't leave us like that. He deals with the sin-producing aspect. So I think what happened to me in Greek year wasn't the initial forgiveness of sins at the cross that the huge debt was paid. It was that I was realizing confession as a Christian. There remains a pardoning grace to the poor, sensible sinner as myself, humbled and agreeing and confessing that in my, as in that case, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, and I'll go on to that later, this confession this um, Meyer realizes is something that comes up as we walk in our Christian walk. It's not a purely outward act. It has, it's an, has an inward fact, like the tendency of the mind. It's expression of sins that are recognized at that moment and then confessed. We are confessing as a Christian to that particular manifestation that we realize in that moment. And Ebrard rightly calls attention to the fact that John here says it's not abstract overall sins like, oh, I know I sinned, but definite, concrete, single sins like those three committed. The mere confession in the abstract that we have sinned would not have truth without the acknowledgement of the concrete, particular sins, but it would shrivel up as a mere phrase. So, the concrete sins confessed. He is now faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He doesn't deal with just the sin, but he deals with the manner of me as a sinner and the stain. Sin does have a stain, and that's what guilt tells us. That's why, again, new generation, this is what's keeping us away. There's a sense of conscience of that stain. We don't see ourselves as spanking clean. He forgives sin and the righteous and and as righteous purifies us from unrighteousness. This is so wonderful about the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit, who the blood of Christ offered to the eternal spirit without blemish purifies our conscience. And what is the result? We draw near to the living God we rise up to take our place as a new generation just one more thing about he is just to forgive us from unrighteousness this is the same root word which is like dikey or dyke so the one place it's used is dyke he is just he is righteous well what would he 
in that being of just and righteous do. He would cleanse us from all that is not us. The just one would cleanse us from being unjust. The righteous one would cleanse us from being unrighteous. Thank you, Lord. You deal with the sin-producing aspect. In the Old Testament, confession that brought pardon would bring pardon, but it met with no corresponding righteousness in the believer. How great in the New Testament that as we confess, we are given a righteousness, which actually makes me righteous. Again, as Romans 3.26, God shows his righteousness to be both the just and the justifier. Okay, one other aspect that I would call, and you know, we're at this conference with younger pastors, may they rise up and see these things and take their place. But this is addressed to some of the younger people I know as well. This is another aspect to rise off your seat. I do not consider, consider myself very athletic in my later years, especially with anything to do with balls flying around. I, it would cause my head to spin around and it would just make me dizzy. But still, in our first church and as a, a young pastor's wife, we would have a volleyball night and I would try to build up my confidence every, I think it was Thursday, to go. I'd get my stance, I'd be ready for the balls to come, I would be confident. But time after time, these balls coming to me were intercepted by someone either taller or thought they could do better in, in the return. And maybe even Ed did it a few times. So the first few times went okay, but by the end of the evening, I'm like jelly. I have no confidence. So when I hear the word interpose, this is my first image, those who interpose themselves at volleyball. But one really did interpose himself for what was mine and what was coming my way. The warning, the punishment, the eternal separation from God was descending on me like that volleyball. But it never reached me because someone stood in front of it. That someone is someone for us to love and gain such a love for. Again, Isaiah 53, bear their iniquities, bore our sins. Hebrews 9, 28, so Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many. Christ endured sufferings in his own person, which if they had been inflicted on us, would have been the proper punishment. He who was innocent interposed and received on himself what was descending to meet us and consented to be treated as he would have, des as he would have deserved if he had been a sinner. He bore our sins. Do we see that there's a place to rise up? We can be in a place as if we've never sinned and we love dearly the one who interposed himself for all that was coming to us. I see a generation rising up to take their place with open eyes that are clean and to the lover that took it away. But this generation, it's been one that's been in a lot of darkness the very things of a godly foundation and education in the home and church. They've been in a barrenness without this. I believe God has awaited for this. Some other things that this generation has been waylaid by. 24 hour peer pressure with inescapable social media, isolation, more anxiety, more depression, divorce, abuse, COVID. God has been awaiting this generation to rise up and take their place. As the words of Hillsong say, I see a generation rising up to take their place with selfless faith, selfless faith. Oh, I'm waiting on you generation to rise up.